Good morning. Welcome to this Sunday in the middle of November. Sunday, it's the second last Sunday of the church year. Next week we will celebrate the end of this church year as we begin to move into a new season of Advent. This is sacred time and sacred place, and I thank you for being here to share it with me this morning. The seasons are changing. I don't know about you, but I certainly feel the diminishment of light in the evenings, and I take confidence in the fact that regardless of the light outside, there is always the light of Christ that directs us and leads us to a safe place. This is that place. I invite you to join with me in the call to worship. You and I are here this morning because God has called us to worship. You and I are not so different. God made you in God's image. God made me in God's image too. We gather together as the great people of God's making. We gather to be transformed with one another and to further cement our connection with our Creator. Let us worship God boldly. We begin our worship with Voices United 608. Dear God, who loves all humankind.
because she was in the news this week. Does anyone know who Ruby Bridges is? You'd know her if you saw her picture. In, oh, how long ago was it? About 60 years ago? She was six years old. And she was one of the first six children in Alabama who transferred to a white school to begin her education in what had until this time been a segregated school system in Alabama. And she was in the news this week because her mother died. Her mother died at, I believe, 94. And uh, Ruby became a symbol of the integration of the American school system at six years old. I think that's an amazing thing to have this small child represent all of this possibility for essentially a whole country. What she says is that for me, being six years old, I wasn't really aware of what was going on, Bridges, now 66, told the National Public Radio. I mean, the only two things I ever, was ever told by my parents was I was going to attend a new school and that I should behave. What I didn't know until I researched it this week, however, you may remember the picture of her being escorted into the school with four National Guardsmen. Once she arrived at the school and arrived at her classroom, every other student had dropped, dropped out, had withdrawn from the system. For that entire year, she was the only kid in her class with the teacher. At six. She carried the weight of a nation at six with grace, joy and hope, and she changed the world. So on Children's Sunday, when we're talking about what it means to celebrate our children, to remember them, that's one of the stories that comes to mind. Now that's not where I was starting when I put the wisdom of children. <laughs> I was going to be a lot happier about this. But this came up in the news, so just to make it a little lighter, I do want to give you some quotations as well. After seeing a pretty nice spider web, my aunt said, that's a pretty web. I don't like spiders, though. My six-year-old, in a serious tone, replied, you have to appreciate the spider to appreciate the web. When I asked my son, five years old, how his day was, he said to me, it was awesome. I asked him, what made it so awesome? And his response was, because I wanted it to be. So on Children's Sunday, I encourage you to remember what it is that we work for. I encourage you to remember that the children are not the future of this world, they are the present, but they will be our future history. How do we leave this place for our children and our children's children? In our indigenous communities, we would speak of the necessity of leaving the world for the seventh generation. So this is a day to remember our history, to remember our traditions, and to encourage us to see them as the future of our children. I invite you to join with me in a few moments of prayer. Holy One, we give you thanks for the young of this world, their wisdom, their passion, their imagination, their joy of being here. We give you thanks for their sense of fairness when so often we pick and choose who gets what. Open our eyes and ears to see and hear new possibilities for the world as we leave it for those who come after us. On this Children's Day, bless all children and those who are guardians of them. The next hymn is a personal favorite of mine. Uh, for a year, when I was 17, turning 18, I lived in Finland as part of Rotary Youth Exchange. And the uh, national uh, composer of Finland is Jean Sibelius. He is the composer of the music for this next hymn. And for that reason, it is just, it's always been a personal favorite. Voices United 652, Be Still My Soul.
are learning as we go. I invite you to join with me in prayer, our prayer for illumination. God of ancient story, shine through these words so that we may hear your word afresh, that we may be enabled to see and feel your presence all around us and that we may know your will for our lives. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. I'm reading the scripture from 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 to 11. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers and sisters, you do not need to have anything written to you, for you yourselves know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. When they say there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them, as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and there will be no escape. But you, beloved, are not in the darkness, so that day to surprise you like a thief, for you are all children of light and the children of the day, we are not of the dark night or of darkness. So then, let us not fall asleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who are drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober and put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has de destined us not for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that who, whether we are awake or asleep, we may live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build up each other, as indeed you are doing. And in scripture, Matthew 25, 14 to 30. For it is as if a man, going on a journey, summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to which according to his ability, then he went away. The one who had received the five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had the two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I have made five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things, enter into the joy of your master. And the one with the two talents also came forward, saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I have made two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many, many things, enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received the one talent also came forward, saying, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not know sow, and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master replied, You wicked and lazy slave, you knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow? And gather where I did not scatter, then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and on my return I would have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one with the ten talents. For, for to all those who have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance, but from those who have nothing, even when they what they have will be taken away. As for this worthless slave, Throw me into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. These are the stories that come to us echoing through generations. They blossom when we open our hearts to hear their wisdom. 
What is your talent? One of the hallmarks of postmodern philosophy, especially continental European philosophy, is wordplay. That is, looking at words and seeing a multitude of meanings that might lie within them. For example, the word other is contained within the word mother. How does recognizing the fact in English influence both of these words? The Gospel parable this morning, the parable of the talents, has been most often understood as a parable about money and how we should use it. Either it's been about stewardship within the church, we should use our money for mission and not hoard it, or about a theological justification for wealth. God wants us to have more money and wealth, and if we do, it's an indicator of divine favor. I would not disagree with the first reading, and I have always argued against the second. But I'd like to tack in another direction this morning. I find it altogether too interesting, and you can read what you like into that, that the word for money in this passage has been translated the way it is. A talent, in the standard Greek definition of the age, was the largest measure of coinage. It is estimated today to be anywhere from $1,000 to $30,000. Another estimate argues it was the equivalent of 20 years' wages for the average earner. However we understand it, a talent was a lot of money, especially to give in blind faith to your slave. Two of the slaves used their talents well and increased their value. One simply hid the silver and returned what was given to him. But today, we use the word talent in a very different way. It never really means money. In fact, especially in the church, we differentiate it from money. Time, talent, and treasure is a common phrase with each of those having a distinct meaning. Talent is something that comes from us into the larger world. It is something we can do well that perhaps differentiates us from what others can do. So what if we read our meaning of talent backwards into the Gospel story? How would our reading of this parable change? We might understand the Master to be divine love in the world, and with that we might understand the slaves as ourselves. We are given talents at our birth, and we are then held to account on the use of our talents as we go through life. In this reading, we are called upon to be engaged in the world as a way of increasing our talents. If we leave as we enter with no growth of our talents, we have failed in our duty. But perhaps I should back up a step and define what I mean by a talent. I do not mean to be narrow in this, but as broad as possible. A talent may indeed be something that changes other people rather than something one does in one's own life. A talent may be a kind of catalytic change rather than a self-actuated ability. This is an interesting point for me as it speaks to the reality of different people in the world. And we think perhaps of Ruby Bridges right here. Was it her talent to change the world? Maybe not. But her in that place and time absolutely did change the world, and so it was her talent. There was at one point an active discussion as to whether individuals who could not verbally or actively express their faith should be included in communion. Now, in fairness, this discussion was more recently important in Roman Catholic communities than most Protestant communities, as we tend to have a more open table. But the idea was that if you didn't understand what it means to receive the bread and wine, you should not do so. The Larsh community was formed at least partly out of this controversy. The way I have defined talents 
is responsive to this discussion in that those who are developmentally delayed are as fully participants in community as their lives often dramatically and profoundly change the lives of those around them. Even if they can't be verbal, they change people's lives. If you've ever read any of the material from L'Arche, or have talked to the past president of Hamilton Conference, Keith Reynolds, who was in Southampton, the common story is that those who serve at L'Arche offer more love and life affirmations than anyone could have believed at the start of the process. The, these individuals, even if they cannot ever speak, have profound talents that they just don't express in normative ways. For that reason, I want to define talents as broadly as possible. So if we are asked in this parable to grow our talents, we are required to face and participate in the world rather than stand with our backs to it. Christians are not to be a people who stand apart, but rather stand in the midst of and participate. This has been true historically even with monastic and cloistered communities. I am not going to argue the relative historical theology of their beliefs, but these communities believed they were acting for the larger world rather than being excluded from it. They often also served as the only source of education in rather remote circumstances. There is a rather famous book, How the Irish Saved Civilization, that argues literacy was kept in Europe only through the fringe existence of Celtic monks in Ireland and perhaps Northern Scotland. Monastic communities lived apart but belonged in the larger world they used their talents to benefit the world around them. This is not dissimilar to a point I made a couple of weeks ago with the story of Jesus and giving unto Caesar that which is Caesar's. No one is called only to a personal relationship with the divine. It is not simply an up and down interaction. We are called into a horizontal relationship with each other as well. And that is the only way in which we will grow our talents. I think this parable is an argument for something you routinely hear me say. We are saved in community and by community. Christianity is not an individualistic religion. So what are your talents? How will you go into the world and share of yourself to see your talents grow? And mark what I said, how will you go into the world? Yes, we need all of your talents inside the walls of this place. But the world is in need of them even more. I may have shared this story with you already. The last time I heard the former moderator Gary Patterson preach, he told a story of a church that was struggling to survive out on the West Coast. They were putting all of their energy into keeping the place going with fewer and fewer people. They were worried about money all of the time. And finally, the inevitable happened. The church closed. And they had been so inward looking that no one in the community even noticed. If we only do our work inside these walls, we will not are called beyond these walls into the world. It is hard not to be insular in some ways, but we have been working hard to be a presence in the community, and that only benefits the community and us. We have found ways to continue the dinner outreach, to be the emergency location for the school next door. I've been invited to judge public speaking at the school next door. We were able to invite the Hepworth Legion for Remembrance Sunday here last week to remind the community that we are here and that we have something to offer. The last thing I want to highlight from the parable is that the increase in talents when the master returned was not the important thing. The important point of the story is that the first two slaves made an 
effort to increase their talents, while the third did not even try. The point is not really whether we succeed many-fold or even a small percentage. The point is to try and not stick our heads in the sand so nothing will happen. The church has been guilty of this many times in its past. Any institution is in danger of being moribund and fearful of change. But it is only in risking change that anything meaningful will happen. And I have to say we are in a somewhat better place than this than some. When I worked with Dr. Bill Curvin, the St. Andrews Professor of Public Worship at Emmanuel College, he was able to tell the story of how jealous his Roman Catholic colleagues were of the United Church of Canada. They would tell him, you can change things in decades. It takes us centuries. We have the opportunity for change. We are given talents by the nature of being human. It is our birthright. Some of us can more clearly define our talents, and some of us cannot even speak them aloud. Some of us change others with our talents, and some of us change communities. We are not to competitively compare our talents. Some give more and some give less, but we are called to use our talents rather than keep them in a box just for ourselves. We succeed in our humanity when we use our talents together to make the world a better place. As I have said before, if we had a directly interventionist God, the Maple Leafs would win more Stanley Cups. It is we who are called to act in the world. If we do not do it, no one will. So take your talents to the world. Come back and tell the stories of, of how they changed people around you and, and how they changed the world. Do not be ashamed of your talents. Understand that they are a gift and need to be celebrated. This is the good news. This is the gospel. More voices, number 37, each blade of grass. Saying it over and over here again on a Sunday morning. 
got me to where I needed to be. So once again, this year the Salvation Army is hoping they can bring their bags of blessings that they put together for Christmas hampers for the needs in our community. Uh, we are asking that you make a monetary donation on your envelope marked bags of blessing before December 1st in order that the Salvation Army can buy body lotions for the hampers. They have a source to obtain these needs for filling 400 bags if we can help, which is a huge issue. Many people make the assumption that poverty and hunger are not an issue in the country, and in fact, they are. Are there other announcements of which I am unaware? I will tell you in two weeks I am going to be on holidays. Uh, this will be the first time I've taken a week of holidays since BP, before the pandemic. <laughs> and I am delighted to announce that uh, David Jones will be taking the service that morning, who is our pastoral visitor. So it will be an opportunity for many of you to get to know him as a person as he comes to offer worship with you that morning. So many of us have continued to support the church in meaningful ways, even though we haven't always been able to do it in the same ways that we've always done it in the past. Change is the only constant right now, but for your, your generosity and your time and talent and treasure, the only words that do justice are thank you and hallelujah. to us, and we to them. 
Help us to see that our acts have consequences. Guide our understandings that we can change and perhaps soften. We can express kindness. We can produce a miracle with a change of heart. An apology can be communicated in a second, in a word, behind a mask and with a light touch. We pray for the love expressed when we hear of Alina S. of Caracas, Venezuela, who dresses in PPE. A cafeteria worker at kindergarten, she goes to her hospitalized father to clean his bed, feed and diaper him in the COVID-19 wing of a city, of a country destitute of health care workers. Lord, in your compassion. We take up our individual duties and jobs during this pandemic that has infected more than 48 million people. May we consider the sick, severely ill, and dying. Help us to attend to this great suffering. Guide the health care workforce. Position their every step and wrap them in the appropriate PPE. Help our hospital administrations fight this pandemic and sustain their resources and mission. Let no patient be turned away. Help us to use our ICU beds, step-down units, rehab facilities, and skilled nursing facilities to take care of each other and all, even as some hospitals must divert patients to other facilities. Sustain those in training and gather our energies to fill the six million gap in nurses needed around the world. We honor and remember the over 7,000 healthcare workers who have died worldwide. Sustain their families and communities in this great loss. We mourn the so many dead as of this week. Lord, in your compassion. We pray for justice and right action by the government of Nigeria as it sets up tribunals to hear and address the lucky toll gate violence and murder of protesters. We are concerned of the independence of its judiciary. Sustain journalistic voices and those who testify on the crimes and losses, even as they are held and beaten. Lord, have mercy. We pray for the people of Austria mourning as a gunman took the lives of four individuals and wounded 17 persons in central Vienna. We decry terrorism. We pray for the nation of Ethiopia as it mourns the massacre of 54 men, women, and children from the Amhara ethnic group attack by an armed group who then looted and set fire to the community. Lord, have mercy. Remove the swords, bullets, and weapons of terrorism. Let there be no collusion by governments of the people with paramilitaries and false liberation groups that kill. Draw leaders close to their people. Draw them close to their suffering. Help them see the promise of each child, the strength of youth who dream. Unlock the cages. Task those in power to protect the least with food and water, not with armed guards and watchtowers. Challenge our implicit bias of who belongs and who does not. Send your messages to those who would build structures that divide and deny. Remind us that our institutions, like physical structures, can act like walls and prisons, denying human rights and causing terrible isolation. We pray mightily for justice. O oh Lord, your tent so vast as the universe we see at night, it contains us in all times. This world is trembling. Call our faith. This world is so broken. Call our active hope. This world is so tender. Call our love. Into the space that lies between us, the space that is the spirit, we offer in silence the weight that lies on our hearts that is only known to you. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, 
as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. <clears throat> Music again. Voices United 688, O day of God, draw nigh. Now and always. 